Hello and welcome to Spatial Data Discovery. This is Professor Davis talking and I'm going to be walking us through using the HDF5 file format in Python. If you come to our website and go under resources and come down to software, you'll see that under the Python packages, h5py is linked here, which will take you to the documentation website. You can look at documentation closer on the read the docs site where we'll see there's information on getting the quick start guide, installing H5Pi onto your computer, and some information on how to create the files and our main three uh, categories for HDF5 is groups, data sets, and attributes. So this will be a helpful uh, resource for you if you do need to look up additional information on using the H5Pi Python API for HDF5 file formats. All right, if you go over to our repository website, you'll find under the scripts folder we have two files that we're going to be looking at today the hdf read and the hdf write.pies so you have access to both of those on your local repository so if you take a look at them over here i have hdf read and hdf write let's start with hdf write so we because we don't have an hdf5 file yet to work with so opening up this file, we'll see that this was our hdf write.py. The import modules at the top, the standard libraries, os, os .path, and sys. And then we're going to be using h5py and numpy as our third-party packages. Numpy, I believe, is required uh, dependency of h5py. There are some functions defined at the top. I'm going to skip over those and jump straight down into the main. So here we see that the first is a try except on the OS environment for DS Workspace. I mentioned that you can create this environment variable for your computer just out of convenience. So if you have it, that's great. Uh, for me, my DS Workspace, if I come over to a new command prompt and cd percent ds workspace that's going to take me to c workspace ds which in my folders is this folder here and if i look there they are okay so that is where i'm going to be storing the outputs for my directory and I'm going to call my file just test.hdf. So that's going to be the output file. And then I simply on line 75 join the directory, which is either your workspace directory defined in your environment variable or the local directory because you don't have it defined and that's okay. But remember, it's going to land in your scripts folder. So just beware that you're going to be creating files in here and you'll want to move them or delete them and please do not stage and commit this file to the repository. All right, and then the first is checking to see if the file exists and it shouldn't exist because we haven't created yet so this should return line 77 should return false which means 81 should be the true version of this if else. And then on line 83, it should print creating the HDF file. And on line 84, you see the syntax for creating a new h5py file. And I'm giving it the path to the file that we just defined and the W flag, which is for writing a new file. And that's all I'm going to run. Everything else down here has if false. So if I run this once, we should create a file in this directory right here. And if I run it a second time, it should then open to this if os.path is file true and print opening an existing file. And we'll see that line 80 is then the one that executes. And this is the same file, but using a different flag. Notice this is R plus versus the W when we first created it. 
W will create a brand new file, a brand new empty file. R plus will open an existing file for reading and writing so we can append to an open file. And they save it to this HD file variable which is basically just a file handle to an open HDF file. And then we skip over all these if falses and we come all the way down to the bottom and we see that there is a close statement so that we do not leave the file handle open but we close it gracefully at the very end. All right, in order to get to this, I have to go to my repository. So I'm in the repo. And then this is spatial data discovery scripts. And we'll see that I have Python write uh, HDF write. And we see that the test HDF file gets popped up here. And we see that it prints out creating the HDF file here. All right. And if I run it again, it should then just say opening an existing HDF file. OK, so we've now been able to create an HDF file. So that comes in lines 77 to 84. We can create a brand new blank HDF file, which we see only has about one kilobytes worth of information. That's just all of the headers, etc. And then we see that we can also open an existing one for reading and writing. Now we know that an HDF file, in terms of the file model, or, uh, the, the data model, ha always has a root group. It is guaranteed to exist. So here I'm going to create some attributes on line 87. I'm going to change the if false to if true. And I'm going to set the attribute of the HDF file. And with this set adder function, I've created, it's a helper function, I'm going to create the author attribute and give it my name. I'm going to give it the date attribute and I'm going to give it today's date, which as of recording is 919. And then I'm going to give it the affiliation attribute and call it William and Mary. And then this last string I'm adding is the directory or the group or the object that I want to put the attribute onto. So let's take a look at this set adder function and see what's going on here. So the set adder is defined up here on line 38. We see that it takes one, two, three, four named inputs. The first one is an h5py file. And that's the file handle that goes to an open HDF file. Then the second one is the attribute name. So we're going to give it some kind of a name. The third is the data type, which is our attribute value. So when we're talking about attributes, remember attributes have a name and a data. So this is the data that is associated with the attribute name. And the last one is the path to the group or the data set object. Remember, groups and data sets can both have attributes, so we can assign it to either one. And the way that the HDF file is formatted is that every group or data set has a path name. So we can define the path very nicely by just using the sla forward slash group or data set name in that hierarchical format. There are no outputs, so this just creates an attribute for a given path, and we'll raise an exception upon failure. So I'm going to see if the attribute is an instant of string. So one of the issues with the H5Py API is that string data types need to be encoded as binary because the data is stored in binary format. So if there is a string, I then do the encoding UTF, which is this, a very common um, format for storing or um, string format, for encoding string format. And then also, if there is a problem that I perhaps forgot to send an attribute value or I'm creating a none type, none doesn't really save very well. So in order to avoid any weird errors, I just encode an empty string 
as a UTF binary. And then the actual API function is the HF, which is the file handle for the HDF file. Then you pass it as though it were a dictionary in square brackets, the path to whichever group or data set you want to access. That gives you direct access to that object, whether it's a group or a data set. Then it, that object always has a dot adders attribute or variable type in this case. And that object has a dot create function. And that function takes the name and the data for the attribute. So that basically then creates the new attribute with the name and data as though they were sort of key value pairs um, that we would sort of think of more in, in Python style. Uh, should anything happen, this is maybe not the best exception, but it's the one I'm using. I just say, uh, this doesn't work, and I sort of print out the variable name or the attribute name, um, the data type, and the path, and just say, okay, something, something terrible went wrong. So that's the set adder. And so down here, what we're doing is creating three attributes. So if I come over here and save, come over here and HDF write. It just says opening an existing HDF file. We do see that the file size has gotten bigger. It's gone from one kilobyte up to seven. All right, so how do I know anything's been written to this? I, I mean, you can't open this uh, and, and actually figure out what's inside of it. This isn't a plain text. This is a binary style self-describing file. So we need to use the API in order to read it which is why I've given you access to HDF read. All right, so let's take a look at HDF read. HDF read, we see on line 14 and 15, we're using the os and os.path and 17 and 18, we're using numpy and h5py. Why I ordered them backwards here, I cannot tell you. And then we scroll down uh, to see the main function here, again, I'm using the same try except, so all of these functions uh, will try to read your DS workspace environment, otherwise it's just gonna look in your local directory. If you don't have this, you can replace all of this with just your my directory equals and then put your path in here uh, in your own version. Uh, please don't overwrite this um, in, on the repository. And then it's gonna look at the exact same file, test HDF, and then it's going to link those the path and the file name together check to see if it exists and if it exists it's going to open it and we'll see here with the r flag not the r plus that we saw in the right so without the plus sign here you're opening the file as read only which means you cannot edit the file which is good that means we can actually access the file in such a format that we aren't going to accidentally delete something or add something that unexpectedly all right, and what this does after it opens it is that it looks for all of the objects under root. So this is the syntax for the root group. It's the forward slash, and I give it the path name. So let's take a look at list objects. So list objects is up here defined on line 88. It returns a sorted list of objects under a given parent. So that's going to require a file object, that's the first one, and then the path, which is the second argument here. We define an empty list, and then we check to make sure that the path is in the file. This is one of those helper syntax functionality with the file looking or working like a dictionary. So you can pass a path and check to see if it exists in the file as though it were a key in a dictionary. Uh, so that's pretty nice in order for us to just do a quick existence check. So that just means that the group or the data set exists. Then it's gonna try to print the keys. So keys, as just you would with a dictionary, uh, so whenever you give it a group or a data set path, you can check to see if it has keys. If it doesn't have keys, what that means is that the, if the path exists, you're at a data set. Because we know that data sets cannot contain groups or additional data sets. 
only groups can contain other groups or data sets. So I just pass the equals zero, so I change it dynamically from a list to an integer. Otherwise, I do a for loop on the keys and add each of the objects to the list. If there was an error, for example, uh, that doesn't exist, I say, nope, that path doesn't exist, and then I return an empty list. So you may get one of three things from this function. You may get an empty list, which means that the path didn't exist or the group was an empty group. You may get a, a list of objects, which means you had a group and there were groups or data sets in that group. Or you actually may get a zero, which means that it existed, but it's a data set. All right, so the list objects function is a little bit funky in that way. So we come down here and we say uh, my objects equals list objects. And then I'm going to create a list of my groups and I'm going to pre append the root group in my list because I know it always exists. And then for my object and my objects, uh, so this will actually fail if you. Um, if it returned a zero, for example, but it was not going to return a zero because I know root is a group. So that's why I'm not doing an if my objects equals zero check. Otherwise, you would want to if you maybe allowed the user to type in a group, for example. So then I'm going to look through each of these sub items and then I'm going to create a new path. So I'm going to append the root to the object. So I'm just building up the paths. And then I'm going to go through each of those paths and then print out the objects in there. Uh, and then list if there's anything in those. And here we see that I am doing the check for zero, which means that I have found a data set. And then if it has no length, that's just an empty group. Otherwise, I'm going to print all of the things in the subgroup. And then lastly, what it does here is reading the attributes. So the attributes for my group and my groups. So remember, my groups up here starts with the root and then is appended everything under the root. So just everything from root all the way down through the first level of groups or diction or groups or data sets under the root and it's going to then run this print adders function the print adders function takes the hdf file and the group so for my group and my groups all right so we come up here and we look at the print adders function and the print adders function takes the open hdf file object and it takes the path to the group or the data set so maybe not the best variable name here called group when it should probably just be like a, an object all right it prints the attributes of a given group or data set and depends on another function called get object adders does not return anything it just prints so it checks to see if the path that you sent it exists. And the path, remember, can be either a group path or a data set path. Then it uses the get object adders. So I'm going to pass it to the same path and the same file name, and then looks for the keys inside that object, pulls out the value, and then prints the group key value tuple. So what does get object adders do? We can come up here to get object adders. It takes the file object and it takes the object path and it's going to return a dictionary of attributes. So it creates an empty dictionary and then checks to make sure that the path is not none and that it exists inside the file. Then it looks at each of the keys in the adder keys. So the attributes are all of the attributes of the group or the data sets. Remember, it has this as a, an object variable. So when you create a new group or you create a new data set, that object has a variable called adders. And it could be empty. So whatever the keys are, if you've created attributes, it's going to then show all the keys for it. Then the value is just pulled from the key 
from the dictionary using the key. And then it looks to see if it is a byte. And a byte is a special string type. And if it is a byte, we try to decode it. And we decode it using UTF-8, just like we encoded strings on the other end when we wrote them. Otherwise, it just saves it. All right, and then there is, if it is if it is none or if it's not there, it just says it can't find it or it doesn't exist. And it returns the dictionary back. All right, so that is what the attributes does. All right, so if I wanted to do Python HDF read, what should we see? Well, it's going to look at all of the objects. Right now, we've only created the root, and we've only added attributes to the root. So it should, in theory, just print out the root. There are no objects in it, so... It sh it's not a data set, so it has length zero, so it should print NA because it is an empty group. And then for the attributes, we're only going to see root, and we should see three attributes, the three that we just created, author, date, and affiliation. So I come over here and I do Python HDF read, and it says objects in roots, nothing, NA. Attributes in root the affiliation, the author, and the date. So again, we were able to now open an HDF file for reading. Uh, we opened it using the R flag, and we looked at the name of any groups, including root, and the attributes of them. So let's come back over to HDF write. So now that we've created root attributes, I don't need to create them again. So I'm going to set that equal to false. And I'm going to create a new group. So I'm going to set this equal to true. And on line 94, I'm going to check to see if slash store, so this is the path that I care about, exists in HDF file. Please note that these paths, you cannot use the os.path.join where I have asked you to do for creating paths to files and directories on your operating system. HDF files operate like a Unix system so that they always use the forward slash. They never use the backslash for separating paths. So you have to define them explicitly with the forward slash for those of you who are Windows users. If it finds this, it's going to say, look, I've found it. It already exists. Otherwise, it's going to say creating it. And we see that this is the file handle for the HDF file. And we use the create underscore group helper function. And you simply pass it the path. It could be a complex path. By complex, I mean it can have slash something, slash something, slash something. And it will create all of the intermediate folders or groups in order to create the full path. So we're just creating one group below root. And then I, as a way of just making sure that we keep our metadata up to date, I'm going to use the set adder function that I used before. In the same file, I'm going to create an attribute called name with the value storage container for our slash store. So I'm going to create a new folder, rather a new group, and I'm going to give it an attribute called name. All right, so I'm going to save that, come back over here and do Python HDF write. And we see that it opens it and it creates a group. And if I run it again, it opens it and it sees that the group already exists. So now if I run HDF read, what do we think we're going to see this time? Well, we know that there is a root group and we know the root group contains a store group. And it, both the root group and the store group have attributes. So we should see both of them printed out, and we should see attributes for both, three for the root and one for the store group. So I run that. Objects in root are the store. Objects in store, nothing, right? We created an empty group. And the attributes for root are the same three we had before, and the attribute for store has name with value storage container. All right, so now we are getting the hang of creating groups 
and creating attributes. So I'm going to go ahead and set that back equal to false because I've already created this group and come down here to creating an example data set on line 101. So I'm going to set this false equal to true just so that we can now look at this code block. So now I'm going to look to see if slash data slash raster exists. So I'm going to look in the data group under root for the raster data set. If it exists, I'm going to say that it exists. If it doesn't exist, I'm going to create it. And what is my data set? Well, my data set I'm going to create is a random array uh, two, uh, values between 0 and 255 a 360 by 720 array. So a two-dimensional integer array of values between 0 and 255. So you can imagine that this is just like um, spatial data that has an integer value associated with a grayscale image, right? Grayscale 0 to 255. And unsurprisingly, to create a data set, just like create group was there to create a group, create data set is there to create a data set. And the helper function here, just like the create group, this is one of the, the niceties of this particular API, is that you can pass the path and data doesn't have to exist as a group already. In fact, it's going to be created intermittently in order to create this raster data set. So this actually does create a group and a data set. And then you can pass it data. So data is just my data, which is a numpy array. And you can also do some things called chunking. So chunking is the ability of taking a, a gridded array of data and storing it into sort of pockets of um, sort of breaking it up like a puzzle so that you can, if you only want to access a part of the data, and one of the strengths of HDF files is that you can directly access data out of the file without having to read all the other data sets. So in like a plain text file, when you open it, you have to open the whole file and you get everything. In an HDF file, you can open up just one little piece of the file at a time which makes it very good for storing large heterogeneous data sets. And by having chunking, you can actually optimize the uh, memory for accessing splices of arrays in such a way that you don't have to open up and access all that memory. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just a way of optimizing. You don't have to have chunks. This is optional. Uh, I have it here just as an example. And then when I create this data set, I'm going to set two variable or two attributes uh, to the to what I've created. I'm going to set one to the group that I just happened to create, the slash data. I'm going to call it the data directory under the attribute name. And then for the raster data set, I'm just going to call it a raster file type. So I'm going to run this once. It should create the data set, which then creates an intermediate group and the raster data sets. Set those two attributes. I'll run it a second time, and we should see that it already exists. So I come back over here, and I do Python HDF write. And we see that it's creating the data set slash data slash raster. And I run it a second time and it says it already exists. Now this time I'm going to do HDF read. And we should see that we now have root, store, and data. So we have three groups. And we should have one data set, raster, in the data group. And all of them should have attributes, so we should see them all printed out. So let's take a look and see. All right, so here we have objects in root are data and store, the two groups. Objects in data is raster, and objects in store is nothing, so we have an empty group. Attributes, we have the three for our root, we have one for data, and one for store. Now notice I don't have the attributes for raster shown here, and that's because I just... I kind of cheated a little bit here because in HDF read, I, uh, I didn't do the iteration enough times to do all of the sub, sub, subgroups, sub, sub, sub data sets. I only looked 
at too deep, and that's actually um, three deep uh, in terms of root group data set. But here on line 167, I can unprint that or uncomment that and rerun, and you will see that there is the attribute to my slash data slash raster, which is just using the print adders on slash data slash raster. All right, so now I can come back up here. I've now created an example data set. So I'm going to set this from if true to if false. And now we have our assignments. All right, so I have an assignment ASC and an assignment PRJ files. So I'm going to find those in my directory. I'm going to print that they exist. So hopefully they both exist. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a blank array. So this is a NumPy array uh, of data type float. I'm going to save the headers, the number of rows and number of columns as an empty list in 00. zero. I'm going to open up my data file which is my ASC file. Then I'm going to read in the six headers. So we know that the raster, the ASCII raster has those six headers and it's just going to go through and pull out the values for each of those and save them in the list. And then I'm gonna read through the file. I'm gonna tick up the number of rows and then I'm going to take the line that I've just read here and strip the new line character. So that's that backslash N. And then I'm going to split. So we know that ASCII rasters are space separated or white space separated. So the split's going to break it up into individual values based on that white space. And then I'm going to cast those from string to float so that my values are actual floating point values as opposed to strings, because if you know reading a plain text file, everything is just a string. All right, so then I have my values. Then I checked to see the length of the values. And n calls is just the length of the values. So that's how many I've read from the very first line, the first line. I'm saving it as a temporary value. And then if I say if n calls doesn't equal n calls temp, so this is basically your <laughs> your your sandbox challenge, which I've asked you to go through and do a checker function to make sure that none of the files in ASCII raster format are formatted incorrectly. So n calls starts off as zero, so this should be. Uh, true for the first one and then it's going to print found new uh, at a so it should be from zero to whatever the length of values are and then i just save it so as it iterates through it's just going to check to see if the length ever changes for one of those intermediate ones so i should only see it change once from zero to whatever the length is and then I'm going to append the whatever values to my RDAT, which is my raster data, which is my empty numpy array up here, which I'm now going to fill and populate with data. Then I will F string, gosh, oh. So here I check f string. So I skipped over this. f string up here is actually a helper function that I created. This is because uh, if you are running Python 3 version before 3.6, you cannot use the format string. Uh, that was just a way it's because I wanted to show that you can check whether or not your Python version allows you to do these special f strings which allows you to then put variables in by brackets and it automatically populates them into a formatted string. It's a beautiful thing. But if you don't have that because you're running Python 3 earlier than 3.6, you can just do the percent %d's and do the percent %pass and pass them digits or numbers. Then I'm going to then resize the array. So I fill it up as one gigantically long array, then I resize it based on the n rows and n calls, and then I'm gonna tell you how big it is. Then I go through the dictionary. 
uh, I create a new empty dictionary called head dict and then I go for each line in head and remember that is the list of all of the first six header items. So the first six header items, I split them into words by stripping off the new line character and splitting them by the white space and then basically putting them in the dictionary as the key value pair. Then I open up my project path. So my project path is the projection of the ASCII raster format. I open up that. I read the only line. A projection file is just a single line. And then I save it as a CRS dictionary. So the key is CRS, which means coordinate reference system. And I just save the string as the value. So then I have my head dict with the six key value pairs for an ASCII raster plus the CRS from the projection file. I then take the data set. I define this as a path in the HDF file, slash data, slash assignment. I check to see if it exists. I check the F string. I can print the fancy F string, otherwise just print it the regular way, and I say that it already exists. If it doesn't exist, which it doesn't yet because I haven't made it, it's going to say creating it and then creating. And here we see a new type of uh, function variable. So we've already seen where we are passing the name of the data set. The data set is just going to be slash data slash assignment. So that's where I'm putting it in my HDF5 file. That's the path. The data is going to be what data are you reading from, or what data do you want to save? And I'm actually going to save it as type integer. So I read it in as floating point, and I'm saving it as type integer. I'm doing the chunks equals true, which is another one of those funky ways of doing chunking. If you specifically want to define the shape of the chunks, like we did up here, with the 9090, and that's because I knew 9090 fit nicely in a 360 by 720 array. And I thought, well, 90 degrees by 90 degrees, if this is Earth data, that's just a nice number. I could have done 45 and 45 to make it a little bit smaller, but you know, you get what you get. Chunks equals true actually will optimize it using its own built-in algorithm. So it will try to pick the best way to chunk your data for you. So it's sort of the, the cheap way of figuring out some data optimization. And then lastly, this is one of the best things about HDF files is that it allows you to compress the data. And I'm going to be using the gzip data compression. There is a couple of options. I believe one of them is proprietary. This one's pretty standard. It does a really good job of compressing integer data. Um, and that just makes your file size that much smaller, which is way better than plain text. And whenever you read the data, it will automatically decompress for you because of the compression flag being saved with the data set. All right, for whatever reasons, if a type error happens, it's going to print it. Otherwise, it's going to then print the keys. Um, so let's take a quick peek and see what happens. All right, I don't have the files here, so I need to come up here and find my assignment uh, ASC and projection and pop them up into this folder. So there's the assignment ASCII raster, which we see is 8,000 kilobytes. The projection's only one. Our test is already up to one kilobyte. And let's go ahead and run. Did I uncomment? I did. I saved Python HDF right. Oh. <laughs> I'll come up here and make that if true. And we'll come down here and we'll, we'll run it again. And we see that we have found my two input files. 
All right, at row one, it found that it was 648 rows by 648 columns. That's my data size, creates the data set. And we come over here and we see that it's only 1,200 kilobytes as opposed to 8,000. It's incredible. That's the gzip for you, folks. All right, so that is your assignment. Your assignment is to find this data set and reproduce it. Uh, you don't have this ASCII raster file, but you will have the HDF and you do have the slash data slash assignment. You need to create the data set in the appropriate ASCII raster format, which means you have to get those correct keys out. You have to get the keys in the right order for the header of the ASCII raster. You need to filter out the CRS that I've thrown in there just to trip you up and then save it into a plain text format. All right, so this has been playing around with HDF files using the Python um, H5Pi API or standard library. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next time.